the golf the golf team won the MAC championship for its third time. Is it safe to say that they're the powerhouse of the MAC? Also, both men's and women's lacrosse teams are in the quarterfinal round of the MAC tournament. All this and more on Bobcat Breakdown, starting right now. Welcome to Studio 125. I'm your host, Neha Sinra, and alongside me are Sports Pause producer Nick Antodias and Sports Director Ethan Logue for their final showdown. Gentlemen, how are we feeling tonight? And Nick, I gotta tell you, it's quite the honor to be sharing the desk with you of all people for the last time. I know we've been through a lot together. Um, and it's also nice that they put me on with an easy win, I think, to close out my sports career. I don't know about that, but it's a little fitting that I'm going to be ending with this show. It was the first time I was ever on air. You were an executive producer, so it yeah. feels little, good to... A little throwback. A little, it feels, feels good, so I'm ready to get started. Yeah. Alrighty, let's get ready to rumble. The golf team won the MAC championship over the weekend for the third straight year. This is also the fifth appearance in the last 10 years. Is it safe to say that this team is the powerhouse of the MAC conference? Ethan, start us off. Well, first and foremost, I'm really glad we're starting off with golf. I feel like we don't get to highlight this enough, and I'm excited to talk about this for a little bit. And I will say to quickly kick it off, if you pick if the opposite of me, I'm going to be very concerned. The easy answer and the obvious answer is yes, they're a powerhouse. I mean, come on. Won three straight tournaments. They've won five in the last 10 years. They're an absolute tank. They set a new uh, MAC tournament record, actually, this past weekend. They shot plus nine as a team overall. Fuki Zhang led the way. She shot minus two over through three rounds, which is just incredible. Curious to hear what you think, but, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of debate on this one. I know this might be one we agree upon, but I'm looking forward to more debate, but I think this is an easy yes. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you right here. Uh, it was with, uh, Yeah, like, it was a pretty yeah. easy one right there. Without a doubt, they're the powerhouse of this team. And... You know, they just absolutely swept the floor in the last three mm -hmm. years. You know, it was just an easy MAC championship for them. And I want to focus on the coaching style. I, and, mm -hmm. like, I was talking to Ben Kane, and he mentioned that it's just very hands-off, which is, it could be causing a little bit of problems. But, like, honestly, the captains just let them do their thing, and they've been working extremely well. They have been extremely close this whole entire year, and that's how the connection goes. I mean, we see it right there in the three years that they've been in the MAC championship. They just swept the floor. And I want to bring in Fugi Zane like there. Mm. Top performer, MAC player of the year. Overall, they just absolutely been dominant in the MAC. And I, I honestly believe that this is just the most dominant MAC team in the golf season. Yeah, first and foremost, I'm glad you're agreeing with me because if you didn't, I'd be very concerned. I mean, we'd have some issues right off the bat. But I, you kind of touched on the coaching side of it. I kind of wanted to touch more on the player aspect. Yeah. And I got to, she's the face of the team. I got to touch on Leanne Peralta. Yeah. Uh, I mean, without her, she's the driving force behind this team. She was the 2021-2022 Mac Golfer of the Year. Obviously, Fuki Zhang this year as a sophomore is that. She's going to be returning for another year. She's just an absolute force for this team. And I think when she started her career as a first year, the program wasn't what it was today. Obviously, they'd still won two Mac titles, but they hadn't won, rattled off three in a row like they have done now. I think she's really shifted the culture of this team Absolutely. and really established themselves as a powerhouse in this conference. And I think that this golf team is very lucky to have Fugi Zane excuse me, for two more years. I mean, mm. that's very lucky to have. And you can't forget about Kaylee Sakoda. No, I was about to say, I'm I mean, glad you brought her up. You know, the co-captains right there, right. Liam Peralta and Kaylee Sakoda. Just and, as important. Yeah, and there are the all-MAC team laurels this mm. year. So overall, this team has just been fantastic. The culture right. is there. Three straight years, they've just been absolutely dominant, and it's very lucky to have this team on Quinnipiac. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. It's time to hit the court. Since joining the MAC in 2013, the women's tennis team have a record of 60 and 1 in MAC play, and they've won seven MAC titles. Nick, do you think it's time for the Bobcats to move on to a more competitive conference? Well, if you have a 60 and 1 record since 2013, I think that you're, you're ready for the challenge. And like as it shows right there, they're taking over the MAC. And we see that like Paula Miller, just an absolutely incredible head coach for this mm -hmm. tennis team. You know, she has been seven time Mac coach of the year. She won this year. And I know that they have been struggling in non conference. You know, we see that in Mac play they do well. They do extremely well, 61, I should say. I mean, yeah, they can't they've been argue with absolutely that. dominating. They're just like sweeping the floor for the Mac, but I would like to see them in tough competition. 
I would like to actually see them in the Big East. Go up against teams like Villanova, go up against Seton Hall. Tough, tougher competition, and I really believe that this team is ready to see some tough competition. But what do you think, Ethan? So you're saying yes. You think they should move Absolutely. to another Absolutely. I'm going to say no. Really? I want to create a little debate here. I'm okay. going to say no, and not for the reason of the skill level. Obviously, like, we've tied 60 and 1. I mean, you can't really argue yeah. with that. That is, in its own right, very, yes, you could easily move on to a tougher competition. But the way I'm looking at it is more of what about the other teams on Quinnipiac's campus. Mm -hmm. If the women's tennis team leaves the MAC, does that mean the men's team leaves the MAC? Does that mean other sports leave the MAC? Basketball, soccer, volleyball, whatever. You literally pick your poison, whatever team you want to have. Do they have to leave the MAC now just because women's tennis is so dominant? I mean, it, it, I think, again, on its own, they could leave. But I think you have to consider other teams, specifically the men's tennis team, I mean, they're, they're a good team in their own right. I mean, they fell in the MAC tournament semifinals to Siena. But, again, I just think when you look at it on its own, I think if they were to leave, it would create a ripple effect. Every team would start to leave the conference, and that could create some major problems. I like how you mentioned that because do you remember Monmouth? They were absolutely yes. dominant in the MAC. They moved to the CAA. They did pretty well. They were with dominant them. in one sport, though. Well, yeah, but like there's, there's, there's competition right there. They're not going up against MAC teams. They're going up against dominant teams in the CAA. Right, right. No, that's a fair point, but they're, that's one team. It's not like the Monmouth women's soccer team, the Monmouth you know, basketball teams, the men's soccer teams. They were all dominant. Of course, the men's soccer team did win some MAC tournaments of their own. But you're just focusing on one team, which is similar to what we're doing with the tennis team. If you're well, yeah. just focusing on one team, yes, they could leave. But you're, it's not like every team's finding success out of conference with Monmouth. Well, that's fair, but I, I really think that, you know, we've seen seven MAC champ like We've seen a couple MAC championships this year. I mean, they've been fall sports, spring sports. They're doing really well. So, like, we can even see some moving up from certain teams, you know. Like, you can see women's and men's soccer moving up. And you but can you're, see you're picking specific teams to move up. You're not picking every single team. But when um, you pick but and you're, choose, but I think that creates problems because then you just have a disarray. You have specific teams in crazy different conferences, and it just confuses everyone. And the school loses out on money. You just run into a lot more issues than if you were just to stay in the MAC. I mean, I get that, but I also think the players don't mind getting a ring on their finger every year as well. So I mean, I mean you got to yeah. think about it from that no, angle wrong as well. That. I mean, I mean, like, just I'm just saying, if they have dominance in the MAC, and we've seen other teams dominate in the MAC. I think they're ready to move up. That's just all I'm saying. Again, I, on their own, yes, I think they're good to move. I just think you have you can't just look at it as one team. If we're talking only about the tennis team, which we somewhat are, they could move 60 and one again. Their only loss, you know, they've only really fallen in the title game of the MAC championships. But I just think you have to look at it from a broader perspective rather than just specifically the women's okay. tennis team. I think you have to look at it at every team on campus. All right. I'm totally fine with that. The women's lacrosse team has not had a winning record since 2012. The men's team has not had a winning record since 2019. With both teams heading into the quarterfinal round of the MAC tournament, what do both teams need to carry over from their successful regular reason seasons? And who would you say is the X factor for each team? Ethan, start us off. All right, I'll get us started off with my pick specifically for the men's and what they need to do um, in the playoffs. Okay. I think the, they got to start fast. Like, they can't right. come out slow, especially in a playoff game. If you fall behind in the first quarter, you're not you're setting yourself up for failure, especially sure. against teams like Maris who are going to capitalize on your mistakes and really take advantage of your slow starts. I mean, if you look at it, they haven't had a lead entering the second quarter since March 29th. Pretty much a month ago, they haven't had a lead entering the second quarter. Sure. Now, I will say this. I'll give credit where credit is due. This men's team is very capable, similar to the women's team, which I'll touch on when we get there, but... This men's team is very capable of coming back. We saw that against LIU. They trailed in the first quarter, and they came back. They won 19-13. But I just don't think against teams like Maris, kind of the one and two seeds of the conference, if you were to make it past Maris and advance to the semifinals, mm -hmm. I just don't think you can afford to start slow. I, I, I like that answer, but you got to also mention the defense. I mm -hmm. mean, eat this whole entire season, every single 13 games, doesn't matter if they're winning or they're losing, they gave up double-digit goals. Mm -hmm. They need to make sure that this defense has to step up going into the MAC conference because this is the MAC tournament. You're mm -hmm. not going to make any mistakes because overall, this men's team has to step up with that because like I mentioned before, double digits in every single game that they played. That's pretty bad in my opinion. But mm -hmm. like I know they had a winning season and they have very good players to step up for them, but you have to help out Nick Demuccio, their right. goalie. 
can't rely on him too much. Though, absolutely. So. I mean, he's, I mean not, he's capable of making big he's, saves. He's a phenomenal player. Don't he's get me wrong. I would say, I would argue, probably, definitely the best goalie in the MAC. He is. One of the better goalies in the country. Yeah, yeah, hands down. But it's just that they need to, they, he needs some help. Yeah, that's like, fair. this defense is just shaky overall this season. No, I am glad you touched on the defensive play, and I'm going to shift it over to the women's aspect. For there, what I think they need to do, what they need to carry over into the playoffs, is their their defensive play. It's been really strong, especially the last three games. They're, they've allowed 20 goals over the last three games, which if you're a numbers guy, that's about six and two-thirds goals per game. Uh, I mean, talk about strong goaltenders. they got a Kat Henselder, another yeah. very good goalie. Their defensive play is great. And if you look at this team especially, again, I said that with the men's team a little, entering the fourth quarter, if they're down a goal or two, I have a lot of confidence in them to battle back, come back. We saw some big comebacks this year, especially in recent memory. So with them, I think it's more of just focusing on continuing that defensive play because if you can keep it, I mean, their last game was 5-4. If you can keep it low scoring, you know, 6-5, mm -hmm. 7-6, whatever it may be, entering that fourth quarter, I feel really confident in this team. They've they've really shown a lot of poise and a lot of determination mm -hmm. this year that we really haven't seen in previous years. No, I, I like that a lot. And, like, we've seen that this team is very different from the pre previous seasons, mm -hmm. but they got to stop with the penalties. They have been... The, the, the penalties have been a struggling, and they have been having more penalties over their opponents for most of their season, and that has been causing them this season. You know, those those losses that they had it, like um, early on in the season, those were from the, um, the penalties. They just have been struggling with that, and if they can just clean that up a little bit, like I said, like, like you said before, the defense is also, also there, I feel like that they're going to be a dominant in the MAC tournament. So, like... I'm going to say the penalties needs to fix for this women's lacrosse I think they, I think they do go a little hand-in-hand, hand, you know, cut down on the penalties. I mean, if they're on the penalty kill, I mean, it's a great way to practice the defensive structure. I mean, I mean true. But, but I, I do think you're right. Obviously, if they are on the penalty kill a lot, that could lead to a lot of opportunities for their opponent, mm -hmm. um, which can lead to issues. But, again, I, I think you touched on it, too, a little. This team entering the fourth quarter is very dangerous if they're within striking distance. Definitely. So if they keep it low scoring, they keep up that strong defensive play, I think that does kind of edge out kind of the penalties and that sort of uh, facet of the game. But now let's kind of go over to the X-Factors. I want to hear, we'll start off with the men's X-Factors. Who, who do you okay. think is the determining guy? You're going to be surprised about this? Give me Dylan Donnery. So, okay, so for... Like, respectable give me pick, respectable so, pick. Dylan Donnery, he has been absolutely phenomenal this season. And so far in these last four games... Five games, excuse me. He has two goals or more, especially in that LIU game when he had five goals. But when he scores only once or not at all, the team loses. Mm -hmm. So if he steps up in this MAC tournament, you're going to feel confident for this men's lacrosse team to go further in the MAC tournament. He has to step up, and he has been doing phenomenal so far. He has been dominating for this team, and I feel like that if he is on, this team is going to go places. I'll be really quick with my men's pick. I went with the graduate student, Dimitri George. Main reason okay. being face-offs. He has a 57% face-off percentage. Very good, very high. And the one point I will make, is if, it's, if he has a big game, he's winning most of the face-offs, that means a lot of the play is in the Bobcats offensive zone. Mm -hmm. When the Bobcats are on offense, they're a dangerous team. I like their chances a lot better. Dimitri George is a vocal leader on this team. He's a big reason for their success. Only a about three goals and assists this year. Not the biggest statistical numbers, but he's very vital to this team, especially if he's dominating in the face-off circle like yep. he did against LAU. And he's starting the offense. Like, he's the one right. who yeah. starts he, everything. So he, he's, he snowballs it, really, and gets it moving. And now moving on to the women, I'm going to go with Mia Delman real quick. Okay. First year, she's really impressed me. She's shooting 50%. <laughs> which as a first year is incredible 28 goals as a first year 10 goals in her last five games i think she's a big reason for their success i like that and i'm actually going to go on the other side i'm going sophia Iacino. Mm -hmm. she just became the new century point record has 100 points in her career okay. at quinnipiac she has 22 goals in this season so i feel like that if you have via delmon desiree kleberg and sophia Iacino all coming together like they have been for the whole entire season they're the main reason for their success. Mm -hmm. They're the main main reason that they're here today and they're going to play next Sunday. So I think that if Sophia Iacino keeps this pace up, we're going to be seeing the Quinnipiac women's lacrosse team go further in the MAC. It all just comes down to seeing if they can actually execute when the time comes. 100%. It's time to take our first break of the night, but don't go anywhere. As we hit the baseball diamond, we'll be right back. you're doing 
thing, Kevin. I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on, man, let's put a ride home. Meet the scan, a simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. I'm here to save you. But I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at savedbythescan.org. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. For what? I'm high. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us. We're back to discuss baseball. Let's round the bases, boys. Before we jump into the debate, I want to shine light on the QBSN games of the week. The baseball team faced off against Canisius, the number one seeded team in the conference this past weekend and lost two of the three games. Now, Nick, what is one positive, one negative that you took away from the Bobcats performance this past weekend. So I'm going to start with the positives and these hitters did not give up against a really mm -hmm. tough Canisius team. They came back late in every single game that they went up against. In the first game, they were down seven to two in the ninth inning. And then they came back, they still lost that game, but they won seven to six. And that's what I really like about this Quinnipiac team. Their hitters do not give up. We see it so many times in the regular season, that Marist series. They were down in every single game, and they came back late in the game. These hitters do not give up. They have been dominant. This, like, they just, the one to five hitters for this Quinnipiac team have been absolutely incredible for this team. And I'm going to start, now, now I'm going to go over to my negative side. Pitchers were all over the place in this series, giving up 30 runs against the Canisius Golden Griffins. That absolutely cannot happen. In the second game, in the first inning, Tim Blaisdell gives, out, gives up six runs to the Canisius Golden Griffins. That cannot happen if you have your number two starter go for that, um, to give up in the, in the first inning. And they're again, excuse me, against top MAC teams, we see from Niagara, Canisius, and Ryder, they only have three wins. They need to fix that up. This pitching has to wake up. This has been the most weak part of this Quinnipiac Bobcats team. They need to step this up because later in the games, that cannot happen. Yeah, I mean, I might as well start with my negative because I have the same thing. It's, it's the pitching. I mean, oh, yeah. like you said, 30 runs in three games, not a positive sign. Absolutely and if not. you're paying attention today, they played against Bryant. It went into extras only to the 10. They lit up 15. Their offense scored 14 runs, and they still lost. So it's a major issue for me. I mean... You, you can't feel confident, really, going into the MAC playoffs. This is the best team this, this Bobcats team has fielded since 2019, really. Yeah. And if you're letting up, you know, 10, 11 runs a game going into the playoffs when you're going to be playing these top MAC teams, it's not a good, it's not a good sign. It, it, it definitely causes some nerves. I, I'm sure it does with you as, uh, covering this team. Um, but kind of end a little more positive. Uh, my pos I'm just going to keep it simple. They picked up a win against Canisius. Uh, I think I would. I wanted to touch on the mo momentum they could build off. Obviously, they did lose today, but when you're looking at it from just a statistical kind of basic standpoint, they won a game against the number one team 
in the conference. It was the final game of a three-game series. That's got to do something for your confidence moving forward. I get that, but all I got to say, this team is so lucky to have Kevin Seiger. He has mm -hmm. been absolutely incredible for this team. The number three starter, which is kind of shocking, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. When you... Your number one stats. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Like he had an incredible impact. summer over, um, over the summer, and he's already pitching, I believe, a 3.38 year race so far. Wow. He has been absolutely it's really incredible. good for this team. It's been top. Yeah. Like last year, they only had one pitcher with an ERA over six. Mm -hmm. So now yeah, under six, under six. Yes. Excuse me. And they had now they have Kevin Sider doing what he is doing. He's helping this Bobcats team, mm -hmm. not having the bullpen show up and mm -hmm. just give everyone heart attacks because that's what it's been. Close games. I really don't feel confident with any of the pitchers coming up, except for one, which we're going to get to in a little bit. Definitely needs to improve for pitching going into the postseason. Absolutely. It's time to mix in Major League Baseball and compare your pro Bobcats. Let's take a look at who you both chose to analyze. Now, Nick, I got to tell you, I'm very curious to see what your picks are. And since you're the baseball beat reporter in the room, I think you should go first. So for my first player, I'm going to be going with two leadoff hitters, Jared Zimbardo and Brandon Nemo. And the big thing that I want to focus on is that their defense improved so much. From the first season, Jared Zimbardo was struggling a little bit when he was in the outfield. And same with him with Brandon Nemo. But now this season, they're starting to improve so much. And they started to be a little bit of having their confidence when they're out in the field, tracking balls, and they're having great arms as well. So that's a big part of their time as defensemen. Lead off hitters, I like that. For my first pick, I went the backstop route. Picked Keegan O'Connor, compared him to JT Real Muto. Now, I gotta tell you, Nick, not a lot of great catchers in today's game compared to what you saw maybe 15, 20 years ago. But JT Real Muto, he is the best, and I think he compares the best with Keegan O'Connor just based off the sheer power they have, reliability, their arm strength, all those things I think factor in really nicely. Yeah, I like that pick a lot, and you mentioned before, there wasn't that many catchers no, in the league that not. are not really that top players. But for my next player, this was an easy one for me. Mm. Kyle Maves and Jose Altuve. Both of them, they're the leaders of the team. Yeah. They are the ones that have been there since the beginning. Jose Altuve, in the beginning of his career, the Astros weren't that great of a team, and he brought them back to a winning culture. And with Kyle Maves, he was there since the first year when he was in 2019, that MAC championship run. And now as a grad student, he's bringing back these young players that they're bringing back that young culture. So this is a massive part for both of their successes mm -hmm. in their career. Yeah, I don't think Kyle Maves is using trash cans though. No, I don't, I don't think so either. So. But I'm for my next pick, going Sebastian Muller. First baseman, I compared him to Matt Olson. A lot of great first basemen in today's MLB. Obviously very opposite compared to the catchers. You have your Freddie Freemans, Anthony Rizzo's, Vladdy Guerrero Juniors. But I think Muller lines up best with Olson. Again, a lot of power. And they, what they've really done, you kind of touched on it with your first comparison, their gloves are very key. They've improved this year. They've become very reliable for this Bobcat squad. Yeah, and both of them, they like the high fastball. Mm -hmm. Muller said, feed off that. Yeah, Muller said after one of his games that he was only focusing on the high fastball, and that's the ones that you can get out. Mm -hmm. Now, for my final decision, I'm going to be going with a pitcher. I'm okay. going to go with okay. reliever Ryan Hutchison, and I'm going to be comparing him to Edward Cabrera. Hmm. And the reason why I picked this is that they have fantastic stuff, but their command is off. Mm -hmm. Edward Cabrera, he would go a couple of innings, he would go three innings, and he would have 100 pitches mm -hmm. because he cannot find his location. But when he has his stuff, he is one of the dominant pitchers in baseball. Same thing with Ryan Hutchison. He doesn't really have the great command, but his stuff is incredible and he is definitely the best reliever for this Bobcats team but what do you have for your final well player? I actually also have Ryan Hutchinson but I actually compared oh, okay. him to a reliever not a starting pitcher because right. he's a reliever yeah uh, I compared him to Andres Munoz of the Seattle Mariners main reason I kind of looked outside of the statistics for a little bit if you look at these guys they're both the number one relief pitchers on their respective teams I mean you agree with that correct? yeah 100 percent. and they're kind of leading their teams in the sense of kind of bringing them back up to prominence I mean the Mariners made their first postseason appearance in 20 plus years last year Hutchinson he's a key player for this team and I think they're both very vital but I want to kind of debate this a little more so why don't we do that send it back to the desk now Nick unfortunately our some of our other debates got went long so we have to be quick with this one but I really want to touch on this Hutchinson uh, comparison that we both have a okay. little difference you're comparing a reliever on this Bobcats team to a starter yeah I know. that is comparing apples to oranges okay. can you I need you to explain this a little because I'm I'm lost to be quite so, frank so you want me to start it okay yeah okay so okay. why not okay, I mean, you're, compar off. you're comparing a guy who pitches one inning to a guy who usually goes out and pitches four to five to six oh, well have you been watching the Marlins so far this season? Well, okay. No. <laughs> but I'm not a Marlins fan. Okay, so as an NL East fan in the New York Mets, I see Edward Cabrera a very good amount. This man can go, cannot go past the third inning. He has the worst command possible. And H Ryan Hutchison, I'm not saying he has the worst command ever, 
but he's a hard throwing he's a hard throwing righty. So is Cabrera. Mm-hmm. He hit, his command is way off. I don't know if you've been watching any of the games, but his command has been way off. And we've seen in the game against Brian so far, Hutchinson threw three walks, and and Cabrera he averages four walks an um a game. So that's gonna be my comparison. They both have great pitches. Don't get me wrong. Ryan Hutchinson, great reliever for this team. They both make. They both pitch great. They have a great uh, selection. That's the word I'm trying to think about. But the thing is, their their command is way off. So far in the last four games, Ryan Hutchinson, he has walked seven batters. Before that, in so far in this season, he only walked five batters. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what you're gonna think. Like, what you got for me? Well, I mean. <sighs> Right off the, I'm still. I don't really know how you can compare a guy who pitches. You go, who's expected to pitch once every five days, throw four to five innings, five six innings on a good day, comparing to a guy who maybe is an everyday pitcher and throws one inning. But you're kind of really only focusing on the negatives. Okay. You're you're not thinking about the positives in this. I mean, I did say they were hard throwing righties. That's a positive right there. (laughs) (laughs) They're Division One in MLB pitchers. I would expect them to be pretty hard throwing. I mean, you don't know. I mean, they. they, I'm sure they have great stuff. I'm not saying that. But you're just saying you're, the point you're bringing up is walks. They walk a lot of guys. Oh, yeah. What are, what's their ERA? I'm sure I – listen, Hutchinson's, I will admit, will probably go up after today. But he's a 1.69 ERA. Far and away the best reliever on this team. And when I'm comparing a guy, I'm, I'm positive. You're more negative. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think happily about things. You're, you're, okay. you're trying to pick out the bad things about people. I'm, I'm looking at this from the sense of I'm comparing Hutchinson to more of a guy who's consistently consistent – who throws well, okay. who consistently goes out there, p- gives you an inning or two, and yeah, maybe he walks a lot of guys, but it doesn't matter. He doesn't allow a lot of runs. He has a 1.69 ERA. Look, don't get me wrong, but like, when he comes into relief, he walks a couple batters, gets taken out immediately, the inning's over, he doesn't get the runs. Like, he, he, he doesn't get the runs. That's why his ERA is still the same. I mean, we just touched on the pitchers. I mean, how they've struggled and how the best starter is – you know, with a 3-5 or whatever it was, which is really solid. And how last year they only had one guy that was sub-6. I see 1-6-9. I think that's a very good sign, and I'm going to compare him to a guy who also throws similarly, who has, you know, the guy I picked, Andres Munoz okay. of the Seattle Mariners, who throws a, who has a 2-4-9 uh, ERA. That's based on last season's statistics. But still, they are very similar, and they just kind of remind, they just complement each other very well. They're both hard-throwing, but they're both, consistent in the sense that they don't allow a lot of runs, which at the end of the day is the most important statistic. If you can look at that screen right there, he has 65 pitches already thrown. Hutchinson has 16. Do you want to know how much I would Cabrera That's last year. That's want, last want, year. But, That's last year. But yeah, but do you want know, to know what Cabrera has so far this season? I'd love to. 17 pitches. Um, eight Inch. pitch. Eight uh-huh. pitch already. Okay. So you could basically compare it right there. Like, I mean, I'm just saying right there. But at the end of the day, one's a starter and one's a reliever. They're not the same position. One's a starter that only goes three to four innings. It's still different. I mean, like, yes, it is. I mean, one goes three to four. One pitches one. One guy's expected to go in there and throw maybe 20 to 30 pitches. The other guy's expected to go in there and throw 70 to 80 to 90. It's a huge difference. I, I mean, look, all I'm saying is I think my debate is – I mean, I, I think my comparison is better. That's, that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> whatever helps you cope. Neha, I, mean, helps you Neha, I want to hear what you're thinking. I don't know what I think. <laughs> <laughs> like one time, I mean, who do you agree with more? Are you going to – I mean, a bit. it makes more sense to agree with someone that focuses more on the positive than the negative. So Thank I you. have to go with you, I Ethan. I appreciate that. I'm just a little, big, I'm big just, ego boost. That, that helps me. <laughs> I'm just more strict. That's all. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> all righty. It's time to take our last break of the night. We'll be right back with our final, final roars. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. But what? I'm high. Oh. (laughs) 
Meet the scan. A simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. I'm here to save you. But I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at SavedByTheScan.org. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on, man, let's put a ride home. Welcome back. Now it's time for everyone's favorite part of the night, the final roars. It's time to watch these Bobcats break down, starting with myself. As a senior involved in student media, I could say I've done it all. Whether that's running the satirical organization, the Quinnipiac Barnacle, leading the arts and life section, the campus newspaper, the Quinnipiac Chronicle, managing the website for the student-run radio station 98.1 WQAQ for or hosting Bobcat Breakdown for the first and last time. Although I may be Although I may not be the most active member in Q30 television, the members of this organization have made me feel a part of it. There has been countless times where I sh shared meaningful conversations with the members just debriefing on our lives. Truthfully, I don't go a day on campus without seeing someone in Q30 sharing a smile with me. The talent and kindness in this organization is ex they share is extraordinary. I can recall my sophomore year working with volleyball beat reporter Emily Sweeney and her graciously carrying our projects because I was so unsure how to work a camera. I could never fail to mention our Q30 president Ben Kane and sports director Ethan Loke right beside me for being a part of my team for the Barnacle. I am forever grateful for their support. Sometimes people say they, they take the opportunity to go back four years and talk to their past self to advise them on what they, what they would do differently. However, I wouldn't. There's not one thing I change in my student media career here at Quinnipiac. That being said, as a student who graduates less than two weeks, I encourage everyone to step out their comfort zones and try something new. Maybe it won't be something you stick with long term, but you just might meet some of your best friends that make your four years go by so quickly, and it makes it a bit harder to say goodbye. Even though I'm a senior, this is my second year, year being a part of Q30. In my first year, I was shy, and I didn't want to be a part of student media. I had to face a lot of obstacles. Obstacles like the pandemic in my first year. Then in my second year, I lost my grandma, who I miss every single day. Her loss took a toll on me and my mental health, and it took a lot for me to get back on track. In my third year, I didn't know what to do with my life, so I finally took a risk and joined Q30, and that decision changed my life forever. When I joined, I was like, all right, cool. I wanted to go on air, which was something I had dreamt of. And not only did I get to do that, but I learned a lot about Quinnipiac sports and its athletes in the process. Q3 has helped me have enough confidence to become an associate producer for Sports Pause and a baseball beat reporter this year. I also was fortunate enough to get to travel to Penn State to watch the women's soccer team play in the first round of the NCAA tournament. These are just some of the memories I will cherish forever. My time here at Q30 has been incredible and it's all thanks to everyone in the sports department, especially the man I went up against you tonight, Ethan Logue. You helped me shape into who I am today, and I could not ask for a better sports director to have worked with. And because of Q30, I finally have the confidence to push myself every day. Because of all of your help, I feel more prepared to go into my master's program at Hofstra University. I thank every single one of you who has been on my, on my side throughout the last two years. And to be honest, I don't know what will happen at Hofstra but I am more ready for the challenge than I ever was back in 2019 when I started at Quinnipiac. To my family, thank you for supporting me in my four years at Quinnipiac. To the people who I lost, my grandma and Barry Sachs, I hope I'm making you proud. I can finally now say I'm done at Quinnipiac and at Q30, but don't worry Hofstra, I'm not done. <laughs> I can't say it enough, but thank you Q30 from everything from the bottom of my heart. Now, I've probably written and rewritten my last Final Roar a good number of times because I want it to be perfect. I want to express how grateful I am that I stumbled upon this club, and I want that to be known. But what I've found out 
is I can't put into words how much this club has truly done for me. Believe me, I've tried, but I just don't think I can do it justice. I've learned about the true wor real world of journalism, learned how shows are run and equipment is used, gone on trips to cover events, learned things that I would not have learned inside of a classroom, and all of the nights I was in this suite until one or two in the morning, editing and making content, or spending an entire day putting together a show for the last three years. God, what I wouldn't give to go through that all over again. Most importantly, I found a home here. On days where I felt lost, this club made sure I was found. It all starts with the people I've met and the lifelong friends I've made right here in this club. The biggest honor I've received this year as a sports director is the members who have come up to me and thanked me for the work I've done and the help I've provided with them. But truth be told, you shouldn't be the ones thanking me. I should be the ones thanking you. Everyone, no matter if you're watching at home, more importantly standing in this very room, I want to thank you. I know I don't express it a lot, but I'm eternally grateful for everything you've done for me. It doesn't matter if we've talked for four minutes or been together for four years. I can't express what you've all done for me. So again, I want to thank Q30 for giving me experience, knowledge, a future, and most importantly, a home.